Still hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Let's go. All right, guys. Welcome to uh, another uh, story time. Yes, this is uh, the uh, Tea with Mike show. Um, today on the show, we ha have uh, Jennifer. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Hi. Thank you for having me. No worries. Looking forward to getting into some great conversations. Uh, so our uh, tea fact of the day is... Uh, Brits drink 165 million cups of tea a day, and that comes from uh, goodhousekeeping.com. Uh, so again, Jennifer, welcome to the show. What did you think about the tea fact? First off? I, I would believe it. That's a lot of tea, but I'd believe it. <laughs> and, and obviously, uh, I like talking about tea. Uh, what, what's your favorite type of tea and why? Well, it kind of varies based on the time of year. In the summer, I like uh, peach black tea, and so I'm not I'm not British, so I don't put cream in all of my teas. But I do like cream in my, in plain black tea. In the winter, since it's been cold and wet, I've I've been and I've also been under a lot of stress, so I've been drinking a whole bunch of kava tea and chamomile, like peppermint chamomile. But black tea, I basically drink almost every day. Also, how many cups of tea would you say you drink a day? Again, that depends too. In the winter, I drink more. And well, no, I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm going to say comfortably one to three cups of tea a day. <laughs> also, I, I probably drink six to eight maybe a day. Wow. Well, I mean, the beauty of tea, unless it's like the super caffeinated, like I like the black tea, it's you know, warm water, some flavored warm water. So you're well hydrated. Nice. All right, so so let's jump in. And do, do you want to tell uh, the Tea with Mike audience? And then obviously your audience, they'll be uh, watching this uh, later, all about you. Sure, sure. So my name is Jennifer Dixon. I am in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I am, I guess what you could call an accidental entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, I can never say that word. I used to be in the energy industry. I was a power trader for, oh gosh, a long time. And um, over, over 10 years, I think it was like 13 or so years. And then I moved into development. And um, my, I got laid off right after going back to work from having my first child. Interestingly, my husband and I were in two different industries. So we both got laid off the same week and we were living up in the suburbs of Philly. We're from Chattanooga. So we were both jobless with a brand new baby and we um, packed up everything, moved back home to Chattanooga in two weeks. And uh, I loved being home with my daughter. Like I, I never thought that I had started moving into a more, I guess, Trading has always been very like very stressful, but once it moved into development, it was a little bit more, I guess, higher end project management, like higher above things and high pressure maybe. And I'd always thought I liked it, but I loved being a mom even more. And so the whole time I was unemployed, I was looking for a job. I interviewed for several. Actually, the day that I bought the studio, I was in a job interview in the energy industry and I basically kind of talked them out of hiring me. And so that's why I call it kind of an, uh, an accidental, uh, an accidental entrepreneur, just because it wasn't my plan. It just sort of happened. Awesome. And, and, and like myself, can you, can you talk, first off, talk a little bit more about like the types of what you did in the energy sector, some of your like, responsibilities because we, we haven't had somebody from the energy sector yet on tea with mike oh well i'm happy to be your first so i started out trading back in oh my gosh what there was a leonardo dicaprio movie about um trading in the stock market i don't know if you saw it and i'm drawing a blank on the name but um, they were just wild and crazy. So when I first started trading electricity, you can trade electricity back in those days. It was a lot like trading a commodity or stock. It was, oh, wow. um, I was on the hourly desk. So every hour I had to buy or sell the required electricity that my, oh goodness, my, my area needed. And so it was a lot of phone calls. It was a lot of haggling. The companies had a ton of money. This is before Enron fell. And Enron kind of set the standard for 
big corporate events. And so it was, it was really wild and crazy. But then as the years went on, you know, Enron fell more and more conglomerations of um, energy companies. Um, the, the negotiating that I loved, like the calling, the haggling, like, dude, no, you can give me more than that. You know, that sort of thing that started going away and it became more automated um, with very, um, almost like that there's like ice that's actually a platform that they folks can you can buy stocks on so it was more like fast clicks and and less human interaction and i didn't love that and so that's why i moved into energy development and so my last job in that sector i was helping to develop power plants so uh, a power plant uh, one project i was working on was up in the cape and putting in a combined cycle facility, adding a combined cycle facility to an existing gas plant or um, helping to build new ones outside of Chicago, things like that. So those are much longer term plans versus trading or balancing the energy requirements every hour. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, kind of cool. Okay. And then, so, so obviously, you, you started off with doing a, like a regular type of profession, like kind of working for somebody. And then, so, so while you were doing that, um, we were, were you doing a yoga on the side as a as a kind of like hobby or, or not? Yeah, it was. I found yoga a little over what was it? A little over ten years ago. I used to do the CrossFit and the running. I still do some strength training, honestly, but. Uh, I was closer to 30 than, um, than most of the other folks I was in my, my <laughs> box with. And I thought I could keep up with them and I hurt myself really bad. And so I went through like eight rounds of four epidural steroid shots to my back because I herniated a disc. Yeah. And I got to the point where I was kind of like walking like this. I couldn't, it just hurt all the time. And if you go from, I was training for a marathon, the Disney marathon with my sister. If you go from running 12, 18 miles at a, a stint to being bedridden, that's like, uh, it was terrible. And so I went through like a bit of a depressed state, gained a little bit of weight. My boyfriend, now husband at the time, he was like, why don't you try yoga? And I was like, yoga's for sissies. Famous last <laughs> words. And um, he, he took me to a heated power class. And I had to, my back was so bad at the beginning of the class. It was like using the handles in the car. I don't know to like pull myself out cause it hurt so bad. And it was upstairs. So I had to like hold the railings to get up cause it, my left side, especially my left leg didn't want to work. And after that 75 minutes hot class, I could bend over and touch my toe and my back didn't hurt. And I, I actually remember like, I was like, look honey. And I did like some jumping jacks or whatever. And I hadn't done that for like months. And he was like, don't go rush it, you know, like, whoa, slow your roll, you know. And um, I basically practiced yoga almost every, ever since, every single day, um, ever since. Because the unfortunate thing is, is you, once you have that herniated disc, like you're going to have the herniated disc. You can strengthen the muscles around it, but then as soon as you let those muscles get weak, the disc is going to go back out. And so that's why... It's, it has to become a lot. It had to become a daily thing for my life. It had to become a, uh, a, like my daily medicine was my yoga practice to make sure that my core and my back muscles stayed strong enough to support my spine so that the disc wouldn't go out and hit my nerves. Oh, my God. And, and so obviously, uh, as you discovered, yoga has uh, many benefits. Do you want to talk about some of the benefits from my health a little bit? For, for, for yoga and how you can use it to help you potentially with stress. Oh yeah, sure. So, well, with any sort of exercise program that you've got the endorphins that come. So if you're a runner, weightlifter, you get endorphins released when you are exercising, but yoga is a little bit different because it's a concentrated effort of combining the movement with your breath. So you are, it's, it's a moving meditation. So you're breathing deeper in a, in a yoga class. If you're not breathing, then you're kind of, that's the joke. If you're not breathing, then you're doing gymnastics, right? So it's, it's the, the concerted effort to continue to breathe very deeply, even in postures that may be a little uncomfortable. And when you do that on the mat, you can translate that off the mat. So 
you know, like today I was telling you, like my, it's been raining, the weather's been terrible and my kid's school was canceled. I knew we had this conversation. I'm training for another certification and I've got like 5,000 things to do. And I was like, ah, what am I going to do with kids? And so that yoga practice that I do on the mat translated into, okay, take a deep breath, take a deep breath. I can't say that I'm perfect. I still lose my temper, but it really does help to all right, man, if I can still breathe when I'm basically looking in my own back pocket, I can breathe when I'm trying to figure out what to do in life situations. So it's it's really great for managing stress. Okay, awesome. And then could, could, you, could, could you give, let's say, I don't know, three, three like, uh, kind of like benefit, benefits of doing yoga and, or, or your three top tips on how to reduce stress? So that's two different things. So for me, the three benefits of a yoga practice was the strength building component, because I still like to, I still seek that being strong and being um, in shape. Second one clearly is, you know, reduce stress and sleeping better. Um, a third one is it keeps you, since it's this lower, slower um, exercise, it's helping to work more on those type one muscle fibers like slow twitch. And so that can be that, especially as a woman, woman, because we tend to have a little bit higher fat percentages and women tend to oxidize fat and men tend to oxidize glucose a little faster. That might be getting a little dorky for you, but it's perfect for me because it gets into the fat burning aspects a little bit easier and faster for me, but it's low impact. And so my back doesn't get hurt. Um, and I'm forgetting what the second one, three ways to get started. Okay. Oh, three ways to reduce stress. So, one, yeah. So one way is you, for however long the practice is, you can't be looking at your phone. So that's a reduction in stress right there. Uh, another one is you are, we, have you ever watched a baby breathe? I don't know. You, uh, so babies breathe and their whole bodies breathe, right? Mm -hmm. As, as adults, we stop that full diaphragm breathing we just barely we I, I joked and say we breathe to survive as an adult whereas babies are breathing to thrive so when you are in your yoga practice and the conscious effort of breathing through your whole all of your lungs not just the smaller part in the front but the whole region in the back you're actually increasing your oxygen intake right and oxygen is life like that's what feeds our brain that's what feeds our body so that also when you can improve your oxygen intake that helps to fight the rise in cortisol which is prevalent in everybody because stress is so everywhere and then what's a third reason why i feel like i've gotten really dorky into science so let me give you like a a less sciencey dorky one like it just feels good and so when you feel good then all that translates off the mat. Like if you start, if you leave the, the mat and you're like, oh, I, I feel better, then that also helps to reduce your stress. So that that was the least dorky answer, scientific <laughs> answer, I hope. Right. Um, so obviously, um, so you started off in the, uh, the energy and the trading sector. Uh, you, you, you were doing um, yoga for fun to, to help you uh, personally. And then uh, do, do, do you want to, you've kind of, touched on it, but let's dive a little deeper on how you transitioned into you and your husband, unfortunately, uh, losing uh, your jo jobs and how that gave you, I guess, the, the motivation, the energy, and almost the mode for survival uh, for launching your own business. So after six months of me being at home and realizing that we didn't have to have those same levels of income because we were both very highly compensated, we were in the rat race. And at the time, I remember joking and saying, oh, we couldn't possibly live on X, Y, Z total amount of money, which just makes me laugh now. Um, after six months of basically just living on unemployment, which is nothing, it's you know nothing and we were fine. I was like, you know, I don't have to go back to that rat race. We're we're kind of fine with that. I can't go shopping. I can't go on the fancy vacations I used to. My sister and I used to travel internationally every other year or every year sometimes. And I can't do that, but I'm home with my daughter. I'm home with my husband. And I really like that. And so that's when I, I remember seeing the yoga studio was for sale right when we moved home. I remember seeing it and I was like, I laughed. I was like, there's no way yoga doesn't pay anything. And I had taught yoga on the side because I loved it. And I love helping other people find what makes them feel better. And yoga generally does. 
And so um, I laughed at it. I was like, there's no way. And then after that six months, I was talking to my husband. I was like, you know, maybe I could look into this. Maybe we could do this. And so we, we use what's called a uh, rollover for business startup. It's a investment tool that folks can use to uh, use retirement income. So I had been religiously putting money away in my 401k. I don't know if they have that in Canada. I don't know what you guys have, but I've been religiously putting as much as I possibly could, like maxing it out every single year. Um, so I had a really healthy retirement plan, but no income. And at the time, right? And so I was like, honey, look, we could use part of this retirement and use that to purchase the studio. So then we're not making payments on the purchase so that right off the bat, we could be generating some income. And to me, it was kind of a, it's risky because it wasn't in the stock market. But to me, like me having a yoga studio that I was in control of the growth, I felt like I had more say in what that income potential could be 30 years from now versus like putting it into fidelity and being like, all right, 2050 retirement or whatever it was. Oh, so, you're more in control of exactly if that environment is circumstanceable or not. Exactly, exactly. So we used the ROBS to um, liquidate some of my retirement, purchased the studio, used it to help re, um, re, re renovate it and all that kind of stuff. And it really was able to give me the the freedom that I needed because I didn't have any extra bills. It was just the regular yoga studio bills. So it gave us the freedom and the breathing room to be able to withstand. I mean, everybody will tell you the first few years of a business, most businesses go out of business, right? Within three to five years. And so we are staring down the, the, the barrel of year number four, which is awesome. It will be four years old. Um, in July, July 1st of this year. And we've grown uh, at least 20% every single year. Last year was much more because we, we started increasing our retail sales. So it's still experiencing growth, which is awesome. It's still a lot of work, which is sometimes it's awesome, sometimes it's not, but it would not have been possible without that kind of alternative investment vehicle. And then we were able to buy ourselves out of the ROB uh, was that last year? I think it was the end of 2018, early 2019. So now my retirement's completely separate from the business. I own the business outright separately. And so I've got just multiple streams here. It's not just all 401k or all um, the studio. So that that ended up working out fairly well too. Sweet. So, so really good. I'm sorry, what was that? It sounds like you're doing really good. <laughs> Well, it's you, you, uh, if you haven't gotten that from me, it's I'm kind of OCD. So yes, we're doing really, really well, but I have like, you know, I'm here and I'm, I like keep seeing these things up here and I'm like, why am I not here yet? And I need to, me personally, here's my yoga that I need to practice is be really excited about where I am right here, even if there's still this other distance to go. So thank you. I appreciate it, Mike. But yeah, we still have a long way to go. It's, a, it's also important to know to stay grounded in the balance because you've always got to be thinking practically, thinking about the risk. One minute yep. could be great, the next is not. Oh, yeah. As, as you know from, I'm sure, working in the trading sector. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, sure. and then, do, do you want to talk a little bit, bit, bit as as much as you can about how you use um, digital, social media, um, marketing, ads to uh, help grow your business, if you do? Sure. Oh my gosh. Yes. So one of the things that makes me a little bit different as a yoga studio owner is my background is finance and economics. So I stumbled into yoga because of an injury, not because of some of the, I guess, softer side. Oftentimes yoga people are not finance people. So uh, <laughs> when I took over the studio, I came at it from a very business-like perspective and that kind of ruffled some feathers inside the studio and also like inside the yoga community at large where I am. And um, I was really big. Oh my gosh. At the very first meeting I had with all the teachers, I was like, listen guys, there's, there was nine teachers at the time, nine. And now we have 27. And I was like, right now we have nine opportunities. If everybody posts something once a day on social media, that's nine different times outside of me to be seen in front of people, to be top of mind, top of all that kind of stuff. And 
if you want your classes to grow, you need to be top of mind. You need to get out there. And Facebook, social media in general, has changed a lot in the last four years. I used to be able to post a meme and be seen by like 2,500 people. And now I'm posting like live videos that are actually like really good content, tutorials, conversations like these. And I'm like, woohoo, we got 500, you know, without having to spend because Facebook is much more into pay for play. And I've played with a lot of um, marketing on social media, but what has seemed to work the most, even with the changes in the algorithms, is posting, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm avoiding eye contact, I kind of sometimes look away to kind of remember where my thoughts are, but it, it, what seems to work the most is regular posting of engaging content, whether it is, you know, me with a picture of my son and I practicing or I having the teacher trainees, like this really authentic thing with the teacher trainees working together um, and just doing that regularly. That has been the best hands down in terms of organic reach and in terms of organic growth for the studio. Some other things that we have done, which I think is just um, really, really, really easy and fun, uh, kind of low hanging fruit things to do from a business perspective. Um, one of the things that I started doing very, very early on was giving back to the community. That's just something that I'm really big on, um, as like ind individually, but also as a corporate, I feel like it's corporate responsibility to kind of give back. And so we give back a lot. We, we, um, adopt a family every year and each time the family's kind of gotten bigger and bigger um, and we do different fundraising events for like we, we were the first people to do goat yoga for example in Chattanooga and we raised in the first year we did it we raised like $2,800 for a nonprofit but which is awesome that's great for the nonprofit but the side benefit of that is we were on every major news outlet for free we didn't have to pay to be on the news so everybody saw my logo they saw me they heard my studio's name we had three sold out sessions um, we were in the newspaper multiple times everybody's talking about it on social media and it didn't cost me a dime it just cost me the time to go to those interviews does that make sense and so for me that's been very instrumental in growing the reputation of the studio out without having to spend any money. It took a little bit of time for me to like send an email to each of the news things saying, Hey, I'm trying to raise money. Will you help us spread the word? And believe it or not, local news stations love to report on feel good things like raising money for a nonprofit that helps children with special, with special needs. Like that's just, awesome for news people right and so it's been it's been really beneficial for the studio every time we we do something and and we do it's unusual because other studios often take a cut of the proceeds and we I never have to take a cut I'm just no 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 all the proceeds go back to the nonprofit because I consider it marketing it's fantastic marketing for the studio very good, very good. and then so obviously as we were talking slightly uh, before before well, we I we started at recording this. Um, so you so you, so you you've just launched a podcast. Do you want to, to, to talk a little bit about that? Why you launched it? Where you want to take it? And how you think it will uh, grow into the overall business? Sure, sure. So. Yes. Starting February 1. Oh my gosh. I was so nervous. I've been working on this since August and I know you'll make fun of me because you already have it. Uh, I'm not the best tech savvy person and I have really cheap equipment because I have little kids and I'm not about to go buy a $2,500 MacBook and then my kid spills his juice. You know, like I, like I will not invest that heavily yet until they're a little more responsible. And so, um, we, we've been working on the podcast because the brick and mortar yoga studio, that is definitely my bread and butter. That's my every day. But let's be honest with the internet today, we can reach and help so many more people all over the world, right? And so I started an online yoga membership platform, Thrive Online, and I provide, you know, yoga tutorials, yoga videos. It's mostly yoga for strength type stuff. And one of the ways that I wanted to get the word out about our online practices is through, we have a YouTube channel, so I offer a ton of free content. And one of the teachers at the studio and I last fall 
Um, actually, we started with a couple and then she got, she got really busy. We got together weekly to start talking about some philosophy, ethics, mythology, some of the other stuff that you don't really hear much about. And so we started that on our YouTube channel. And what we found was, we talked about this a little bit, is although I don't have a ton of subscribers yet, and so if you want to subscribe to the Thrive Yoga and Wellness uh, YouTube channel, <laughs> I had to plug that. But we have a very dedicated following. Like we have at the time of this video, we have just over 400 subscribers, but we're well over 6,000 hours of watch time. And that's because folks are listening and watching what we did. And so after we did that, uh, it was a kind of a trial run with a weekly kind of mythology philosophy conversation. It was such a big hit. Um, I, I talked with the other lady. I, we, I, we vlog with and I said let's make this a let's let's make this part of the podcast and so we I took all of our conversations from basically August September through to the end of the year and then I every other day I mix those with some yoga tutorials yoga sequencing things like that to try to test which ones would people be more interested in um, there used to be podcasts that had yoga classes on them but now with YouTube there there's there's as far as I could find there was nobody doing it and I thought well certainly maybe somebody wants to go somewhere like in the hotel room or whatever they don't have the best internet but they, so they can't do video but they could do audio so I was like well let's bring that back so um, part of it will we'll have two hopefully two episodes a week where we do a little bit of me teaching straight up yoga tutorials, classes, and then the other one will have those discussions. And I'm hoping to see which one folks like, but it's all the effort is again, to, to bring everybody back to Thrive Yoga and Wellness or to Thrive Online, our online component. Long story, longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 can, I can relate because uh, my, my biggest um, challenge right now and what I'm working towards, I have the, I have the Facebook page I, I just uh, launched my, it's on podcast too, but I, I just launched my website. So, so, Congratulations. So, so now I'm trying to, thank you. So now I'm trying to, trying, trying to steer people a little bit away from the Facebook page um, to go like, watch the stuff like on teawithmike.com because whilst it's on Facebook, like obviously there's, I'm sure, pretty sure Facebook owns the content and all those complicated things. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to steer people to teawithmike.com, but it, but it's going to take time because people for like about a year have been used to going to the, to the one spot. Right. So mm -hmm. that's one of my challenges. And then another challenge is because website, everything takes time, especially when you're one person with limited resources, which I am right now, I've, I've got to develop like a interactive section of the website. So people can potentially start leaving like comments and like, see other members and stuff yeah and the challenge also there is you know that was in control of the spam and the bots you know and so yep and, and then i'm thinking do i want that like I don't, it's a tough one isn't it what oh it, for sure it for sure is i i feel your pain big time because facebook's want facebook wants everybody on their platform like long and short of it i was listening to a podcast a couple weeks ago and the the guy was saying actually to upload video content natively onto facebook but then or or podcast content just upload it into facebook don't link it away but have a link to your website on the post somewhere because then it's organically Facebook's going to like it better if you're not sending them away, but then you also have to have it on your website and you also have to have it on all the other podcast outlets. Like, dude, I feel your pain, man. It's like in one thing. So your podcast here, it, to grow your audience, you have to also turn it into your blog post and you have to also share it with everybody like on Twitter and Reddit. And it, it's, it's very hard as a, as a one man operation. And I'm lucky because I have a lot of help at the studio, but right now, I'm the one man operation for the online stuff. So, oh my gosh, I feel your pain. I, we, that's what I was telling my husband. We, we do, we usually do three blog posts a week and then we upped it to four videos a week. And that's a lot of content. Mm -hmm. And that's in addition to my other studio responsibilities and it's exhausting. But right now, since we're still growing the audience, it, it seems like, like you, I can't, I don't want to spend the resources that we have on somebody else to do these things for me because I want to reinvest it in better technology. So I feel your pain big time. I feel, feel your pain. And it's just, 
Um, I one of the groups I, I actually am, I have a mentor, and they 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 call it breadcrumbs. I don't know if you remember the the fairy tale Hansel and Gretel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's like bread just post it everywhere and it's all bread comes back to you. So like, for example, our vlog is on YouTube and then I make it be a blog post and now it's going to be a podcast. And then I share it all over every social media on the planet. And hopefully they keep seeing that logo and they keep seeing these links and that'll all lead them back. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so in terms of effective social uh, media channels for me, I, it, I think the think the think the reason why Facebook page is doing so well is because that's where Tea with Mike started. So it's so it's been around the longest, and then it was just on Facebook. As at the very beginning, it, I was actually doing it on like Facebook Live, but then I moved away from that because it, if the other person doesn't come in, you're like you're a little bit vulnerable because you're live in front of everyone and people are shooting in, but the, the guest might have a technical issue or. My, I might have an issue. So that, that was the problem with like doing it live at the beginning. Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. why I transitioned eventually into this, this format. Makes sense. Yeah. Did you notice a drop in your organic reach when you went from live to uploading natively? No, no I think that's partly because I made the switch super early before people got kind of comfortable. Ah. And, then the ones at, and then the ones at the beginning were, like, because you're still figuring out the technology, they, they, they weren't as good because still working out the format. And then it used to imp improvise it live and it, it didn't quite come off. But, but now with a few notes, I, the conversations got like, more fluid and stuff and practice, right? So, yep, yep, practice does it. And that was the other thing about putting it, putting our podcast out every day. I was like, I don't know how to do this. We just used Anchor. Like, I was all excited when I figured out I could put background music on it. I was like, holy cow. This is a but it took me several episodes to figure that out, you know? And so, <laughs> kind of embarrassing. But no, I think that's great that you kind of, you kept doing it, even though it wasn't going to be A plus work at first. You just kept doing it because every time you do it, and the longer you do it, the better it's going to be. So, so my, my Facebook page has uh, like grown every every single week for over a year. Like, oh, that's awesome! It's like it's never declined. Obviously, some weeks more engagement, other weeks more video, just depending on what was being posted and a little bit on what people like. But 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 even, so, I, I usually average uh, like organically reaching at least three hundred people, and and then some of my best stuff. Like there was a post a, few, a while ago when I was introducing a different guest and the organic reach was like 1.5K. Mm -hmm. so, so it is still doable. It's just harder because there's more people and Facebook changed it a little bit, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then one of my challenges, I really want to grow my podcast. Mm -hmm. It's got like a, it's only hit 200 plays and it's got seven subscribers. But I, I really want to spend some time with, like learning and working how to like growing, growing, and it's really just been a question of time. Like, oh my God, there's so much to do, and also yeah. the, it's not so much about how, like how long it takes to create the content; it's how long the videos take to export. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's a huge problem. We're in Chattanooga, believe it or not, we have some of the fastest internet in the country. Um, we have a, actually there's an onslaught of San Francisco people moving into Chattanooga because several years ago they they did gig service everywhere basically. And so when I upload stuff, like right before we started, I was uploading a couple of 10, 15 minute videos to our YouTube channel, and it did it within a couple of minutes, no big deal. But we went visiting. Yeah, I know your eyes are huge. Um, we went down to um, a place down in the panhandle of Florida over the summer and I tried to upload like a 12 minute video thinking it would be the same. And it was an hour and a half later, it was still uploading and I was like wanting to pull my hair. I was like, oh my God, what's wrong with this place? And then it dawns on me, we're just really spoiled. <laughs> That's it, I'm good. Yeah, I know, all right, you should come down and it's warmer. <laughs> It's yeah, still no, freezing. Uh, right now, it'll, for me to, to upload a video, it'll take anywhere from 30, 40 minutes to two hours. 
Oh my gosh! Yeah, no, we, we have get... the best internet we can get and stuff. So it's not like we're on the like the low quality or anything. Wow! Yeah, we're on basically the low end of that gig service. I forget what it is, but it's like sixty bucks a month, and I still have ridiculous upload and download speed. So come to Chattanooga, but maybe not because everybody's moving to Chattanooga and it's getting cool, crazy. Cool, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're coming though. It's it's become a big tech center. Awesome, and as we kind of move towards the end of this uh, wonderful conversation, got any kind of uh, closing closing thoughts, words of wisdom, advice, questions for me? Anything you like? Sure. Well, I just want to. I'm so thrilled to have met you, Mike, and I hope that we can stay in touch and keep motivating each other. It seems like we're kind of on very similar tra tra trajectories. That's the word. So I hope that we can kind of encourage each other and and um, maybe for anybody, whether they're they're listening now or in the future, if you're thinking about doing it, odds are you might not be an overnight success. There is that opportunity and there's that chance. So just don't give up. Don't don't give up because I, I see glimpses, you know, and, and I'm probably I'm pretty sure you do, too, because you see it's growing every single week. So the the key is not to get lost down here in the weeds, you know, and um, just keep trying to fly above it, see the big picture and look at those those numbers. And like you had asked me before we started recording, which minutes, which durations Ooh. seem to do better. And I'll be honest, I haven't even wanted to look at it yet because I've only got 11 days of data. And so I was like, I'm not. I, I don't know. I'm going to wait until I have more data. I want to get that bigger picture so I don't make decisions and act rashly. So hopefully we can stay in touch and help motivate. And then the folks that are listening, if they're, they're entertaining the idea of podcasting, blogging, online business in general, I'm definitely not the, I haven't made it to the other side. I'm not one of those gurus that are making like a thousand dollars a minute or whatever, but just keep plugging away because it's, it doesn't take that much. There's how many, however many billions of people in the in the world. There's going to be some that resonate with you. And so, our job is to keep putting the content out, keep sharing it with everybody, keep making something that's meaningful. Because if it's meaningful for you, then it's probably going to be meaningful for someone else too. So, it's things like that. I have to like I really have to think about that sometimes when I'm like ready to throw the computer out the window. <laughs> Awesome, man. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you today. Me too. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, 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 guys, uh, this was an or another story slash conversation uh, with uh, myself and uh, Jennifer. Um, you'll be able to check out this episode at uh, uh, It will also include uh, some of Jennifer's links where you can go check out her yoga studio De and definitely probably more her uh, YouTube channel if you don't live in uh, Chattanooga. Is that right, Chattanooga? That's right. Awesome. And uh, and so I, I look forward to everyone watching this um, episode. So thanks again, Jennifer. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.